What is your understanding of democracy? What does it mean? Let's first look at some commonly known definitions of democracy. We already know that the word democracy originated from a Greek word that means the rule of the people. This is in line with Abraham Lincoln's definition of democracy. Democracy is a rule of the people, by the people, for the people. From this simple definition, you can clearly distinguish democracies from non-democracies. For example, we know that Myanmar is being ruled by the army. That is, those who are in control of the army are making the decisions for the country. The people of Myanmar have not elected these rulers. This clearly shows that Myanmar is not a democracy. General Pinochet, who led the coup in Chile, was also not elected by the people. His rule can be called dictatorship. Some countries are ruled by one person who is wholly set apart from all other members of the state who are called his subjects. The will of the people has nothing to do with the selection of the ruler. These countries are not democracies but monarchies. For example, Saudi Arabia is a monarchy where the kings have ruled because they are born into the royal family. Did you know India's neighbor, Nepal, was also a monarchy for about 239 years? In 2005, King Yanendra took complete control of the government, dismissing the elected parliament. Following opposition to his direct rule, he was peacefully deposed in 2008. Thus, Nepal's newly elected Constituent Assembly abolished the monarchy after the elections in April 2008. Nepal is now a federal republic. Democracy can be of several types. However, the two main types of democracies are representative democracy and direct democracy. In representative democracy, the people elect individuals to represent them. These representatives are given the authority to rule the country. India is a representative democracy. In contrast to representative democracy is direct democracy. In a direct democracy, the citizens participate in the decision-making personally, rather than relying on intermediaries or representatives. Switzerland is an example of direct democracy. In Switzerland, 5 million voters decide on important national issues through referendums and initiatives two to four times a year. A referendum involves direct voting. The entire electorate is asked to either accept or reject a particular proposal. The proposal may be for the adoption of a new constitution, a law or a specific governmental policy. The simple definition of democracy that has evolved so far tells us that democracy is the people's rule. However, this definition cannot be used blindly. For example, we cannot assume that all governments that hold elections are democratic. For example, elections are conducted in Pakistan and China. But the real power does not necessarily vest in the people who are elected. In the next module, we will explore the definition of democracy further and arrive at an understanding of the features of a true democracy through some case studies. In the previous chapter, we discussed a simple definition of democracy.
democracy is a form of government in which the rulers are elected by the people. Let's first analyze the word rulers. Pakistan has a democratically elected government till October 1999 when General Parvez Musharraf led a military coup. A coup is the sudden unconstitutional deposition of a legitimate government. A coup is usually led by a small group of the existing state establishment typically the military, to replace the deposed government with another, either civil or military. After the coup in October 1999, General Musharraf declared himself the chief executive of the country. Later, he changed his own designation to president. In 2002, he held a referendum that granted him a five-year extension. However, it was alleged that there had been a fraud in the referendum. A referendum is a direct vote in which the electorate is asked to either accept or reject a proposal. To further strengthen his power, Parvez Musharraf's next step was to amend the Constitution of Pakistan. He did this by issuing a legal framework order that gave the President the authority to dismiss the national or provincial assemblies. Elections were then held to the national and state assemblies. Thus, Pakistan had elected representatives with some powers. However, the work of the civilian cabinet was supervised by a National Security Council dominated by military officers. The military officers and General Musharraf himself had the power to override any decisions made by the civilian cabinet. Thus, the elected representatives were not the real rulers of Pakistan. Similarly, many dictatorships and monarchies have an elected parliament and government with the real power vesting in the people not elected. If you recall the power of the USSR in communist Poland and that of the US in contemporary Iraq, the real power vested with another country in these cases. Therefore, these also cannot be regarded as people's rule or democracies. From all these examples, it is clear that in a democracy, the elected representatives of the people should have the final decision-making power. This is the first feature of democracy. Let's move on to another key word, elections. We'll analyze the example of a country where elections are held regularly, China. China has elections every five years. Every time the people elect the country's parliament, called Chungao Renmin Daibiao Tahui, or the National People's Congress. This parliament has almost 3,000 members from various parts of China and holds the power to appoint the presidency of the country. Some members are elected by the army. So far, it sounds like a democracy. However, not everyone can contest in these elections. Every candidate, before contesting, needs to be approved by the Chinese Communist Party. In 2002-2003, to contest elections, the candidates needed to be members of the Chinese Communist Party or one of the eight smaller allied parties. Result? The Communist Party forms the government every time. Similarly, every six years, Mexico holds elections to elect its president. Until 2000, 
every election was won by a party called the PRI or the Institutional Revolutionary Party. This was not because the PRI was the most popular party. The PRI won by using a number of dirty tricks. For example, all government employees and the teachers and parents of students in government schools were compelled to attend PRI meetings and vote for them. The media was also in cahoots with the PRI, reporting activities of opposition parties only to criticize them. The PRI even shifted polling booths and used large amounts of money for its candidates. So, in effect, though Mexico has never been under military or a dictator's rule, the Mexicans didn't really have a proper choice in selecting their representatives. Neither of the cases we just examined can be considered examples of people electing their rulers. The foundation of a democracy is free and fair elections, in which the ruling party also faces a fair chance of losing. That is the second feature of a democracy. Let's move on to the third and the most important keyword, people. Even today, there are many places where the equal right to vote is denied. We look at some examples here. The first example is Saudi Arabia, where women are not allowed to vote. Another example is Estonia, where the citizenship rules make it difficult for people belonging to the Russian minority to gain the right to vote. Finally, let's look at Fiji, where the electoral system gives more value to the vote of an ethnic Fiji and less to that of an Indian Fijian. These countries cannot really be qualified as democracies because political equality for citizens is lacking. Thus, in a democracy, all adults who are citizens of the country should be allowed to vote, each vote having equal value. What happens if the popular government turns out to be undemocratic? It is possible for popular leaders to be autocratic as well, as has been seen in a number of case studies. Zimbabwe was under white minority rule till it attained independence in 1980. Zimbabwe African National Union Patriotic Front, ZANU-PF, the party that led the freedom struggle, has ruled Zimbabwe since then. The leader of the Patriotic Front is Robert Mugabe, who changed the constitution banned protests, harassed the opposition, controlled the media, and influenced the judiciary. Thus, though elections were held regularly, they were always won by the Patriotic Front. Clearly, popular approval of the rulers is necessary in a democracy, but it is not enough to categorize a country as a democracy. In a democracy, before the elections, Adequate leeway needs to be given for normal political activity and opposition. The citizens should be free to think and form opinions, to be able to express these opinions in public, form associations, and take other political actions. Additionally, all rights should apply to everyone equally. Finally, there should be an independent judiciary to protect the rights of the citizens without any political pressure. Now, let's consider the conditions that apply to the way a government is run after an election. Winning an election does not entitle a democratic government to do whatever it likes. The government in power needs to respect and honor the guarantees to the minorities. Additionally, major decisions cannot be taken without going through a number of consultations at every step. All office bearers are assigned certain rights and responsibilities 
by the Constitution as well as the law. They are accountable for fulfilling their responsibilities to the public as well as to other independent officials. Thus, we can deduce that a democratic government rules within the limits set by the constitutional law and the citizens' rights. That is the fourth and final feature of a democracy. We all need to introspect, weigh the pros and cons of democracy, and arrive at our own personal views on the subject. Let's start with a review of the main arguments typically presented against democracy. Democracy can lead to instability as the leaders keep changing in a democratic government. Quick action is not possible in democracy because many people need to be consulted before making any kind of decision. Politicians are not too concerned about morality in a democracy because this form of government is all about political competition and power play. In fact, electoral competition provides a lot of scope for corruption. Elected leaders may not necessarily be qualified to understand the best interests of the people. This can lead to bad decisions. Finally, it can be said that ordinary people are not qualified to select a good leader and so should not be given that power. Many of these arguments are indeed valid. However, some of the points mentioned could apply to any form of government where power is misused. The above arguments against democracy may showcase it is not the ideal form of government. But the debate here is whether democracy is better than other forms of governments that we are aware of. To resolve this dilemma, let's look at the other side of the coin. The arguments for democracy. China recorded the worst famine from 1958 to 1961 in the history of the world with a toll of more than three crore. Whereas India, in spite of worse economic conditions, did not have such an acute famine. Economists think it was because the government's policies in India were different. India, being a democracy, had multi-party elections, an opposition party looking over the government's shoulder and a press free to criticize the government. Therefore, the Indian government responded to the food scarcity in a manner very different from that of the Chinese government. In a non-democracy, the rulers may or may not respond to the needs and wishes of the people. Thus, we arrive at our first argument in favor of democracy. A democratic government is more accountable to its people. As mentioned earlier, democratic decisions involve a series of consultations, meetings and discussions among many persons. Granted that such a decision-making process is time-consuming, this helps a democracy guard against rash or irresponsible decisions. That's our second argument in favor of democracy. A democratic government can ensure better decisions. During our earlier discussions on democracy, you learned that all individuals may have different ideas, ideals and values. This is especially true in a country of vast social diversity, such as India. However, in a democracy, no one can be regarded as a winner or loser permanently. Therefore, democracy enables people to deal with differences and conflicts in a peaceful manner. This was the sum of the arguments about the effects of democracy on the quality of government and social life.
However, the more important aspect of democracy is the effect of democracy on citizens in enforcing political equality. Democracy enhances the dignity of citizens. It accords the same status to all people regardless of wealth or education. Rather than being subservient to a ruler, the citizens rule themselves through elected representatives. When they make mistakes, they assume responsibility for their own mistakes as well. Thus, democracy is better than other forms of government because it allows us to correct our own mistakes. No form of government can guarantee perfection. However, democracy as a form of government allows for relatively more transparency, public discussion and correction of mistakes. Ours is a representative democracy. People rule through their elected representatives. The limited understanding of representative democracy is Firstly, it is not physically possible for all of them to sit together and make collective decisions. Secondly, all citizens may not have the time, skill or inclination to take part in the decision-making process. It also limits us to democracy in a government. For an understanding of the operations of a democracy beyond government functions, we need to look at the broader meaning of democracy. For example, families and schools can be democratic as well. In a democratic family, the opinion of each family member is given equal importance in making a decision. Similarly, there is scope for democracy in schools as well. Students like teachers who encourage them to be curious learners. A decision is democratic if it is made after consultation of everyone likely to be affected by it. For example, in relatively small communities, like a Gram Sabha, all the members can sit together and make decisions directly. The features of democracy that we discussed in earlier modules provided a basic foundation for our understanding of democracy and also what an ideal democracy should be like. Thus, broadly speaking, democracy involves public participation, consultation and representation.